What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to this week's episode of the Pertinier Outdoors podcast. Slick Willie here, reporting from very lake effect snowy Wyoming County. Winter has officially set in this evening, and we are happy to see it in time for the gun opener here this weekend in upstate or upstate the the southern zone of upstate New York. Excuse me. So uh, this discussion was. Dallas and I got together last Friday night and had kind of a breakdown discussion of how this season has gone so far. Um, talked a little bit about our successes and some of the things that have developed over the last couple of weeks. Um, how the how the week of November eighth uh, and 9th was, which was freaking fire. Um, a lot of bucks were killed that week, so we talked a little bit about that, and then of course we get into discussing what some of the game plans are for this upcoming weekend. So. I uh, wanted to cut this quick intro in, say hello, thank you all for listening, and I hope you're enjoying some of the bonus content we're throwing on here uh, from Ben Williams with his his new podcast, uh, White Tails and Whiskey. I've been appreciate him letting us post that content up on here to share with with our Pertinier community, and uh, those guys continue to do live shows on Bullhorn, Facebook, and YouTube uh, every Wednesday night. So I really appreciate. Uh, them doing that and it's good to see uh, see some of that con- local content being created consistently and and uh, kind of picking up the slack where I've fallen off here over the last few months I I don't even know how there's enough time to get anything done anymore I don't even know how I did it before because um, I don't think my life is any more busy than it was um, but perhaps it is and uh, for example uh, you know you go and uh, shoot a deer and it takes you three days to process the damn thing because it takes time. Um, this week's been a blur. It's already Wednesday night, and I'm recording this at like 9.30, and I've been up since 4.30, and I'm ready for bed. Um, and that's just the way the days seem to go. So I'm trying to get as much stuff done here as I can. I'm down in the basement packing up some stuff, getting gear set up. It's uh have not had to run any cold gear yet this year, so I'm having to kind of repack my tote and get ready for uh, for Saturday's opening day hunt. Saturday and Sunday look cold both days and uh, plan to be out in the woods all day. So I need to get my, my clothing system tuned up, geared in. Um, I will be hiking way in on, Mon- on Saturday morning uphill. So it's always uh, interesting to do that first thing in the morning, get a good sweat pumping and uh, not get yourself totally soaked and, uh, and, and freezing cold after you sit back down for an hour. Uh, before the sun comes up so that is uh what i'm focused on working on right now but uh two deer in the cooler in the freezer feeling pretty good about myself and very much looking forward to having a buck tag back in my pocket and uh it's going to be very selective big jim and i were talking about it today and uh we're both a couple two-year-old killers we love shooting our nice respectable two-year-old bucks but i will tell you what i'm uh really going to try to be very protective of that buck tag and selective of what I shoot at and why not because uh we've got some good bucks running around and uh I don't need the meat I'm gonna have lots of opportunity at does and I'll get my meat that way um I put chubby in the freezer early in archery season and I'm that's left me in a good place and uh that doe I just shot last week she uh she grossed a nice nice amount of meat very little meat barely any meat wasted um that shot was in the rib cage and and uh, the actual butchering process was very clean, and I got a lot of meat off of her too. So we're sitting pretty here, and uh, a couple, two, three more does, and we'll be we'll be set on venison, and then we'll be focused on. Jimmy and I were talking today. Um, we really want to donate some deer this year, so we've got a bunch of doe tags um, with a couple of the farms we hunt that we're going to be trying to fill some of those doe tags and uh, and donating some of that meat to help feed the needy. Uh, we really enjoy partaking in that venison donation program here, uh, as you've heard us talk about on episodes past and, and the efforts that we've done to raise money for them. So very much looking forward to uh, to doing that, and that's a, that's a focus as we move into gun season here. So um, I'm going to wrap her up. Enjoy the chat with Uncle Dallas. If you haven't gotten your pertinier gear yet, I put up a couple posts to let you know inventories getting a little thin so if you need a hoodie a t-shirt or any hats um, check out the website or hit me up directly and uh, we'll get you tightened up so appreciate your support best of luck this weekend shoot straight 
aim small, miss small, all that good stuff, and uh, just make sure you got another round ready to rack in the chamber because that second shot's always the best one. Fade them. Hello. I, uh... Yeah, yeah, that's your yeah. name. Squirrels got me. Big Jim. Yeah. <laughs> and really, 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 really cold and fun. Cold and fun. That's good that you think that of it because that's what you think ultimately is, is cold and fun. <laughs> Yesterday morning, I'm glassing up on the pass and I see these deer moving. And I'm like, ooh, there's deer moving. All of a sudden, I just see this person just head down, just hauling ass wearing shorts and a t-shirt with a pack on. And I'm like, I'm like, is that tart? My dad always talks about floating through the woods like the autumn breeze. So, so Robert's when you're the 275 pounds, I don't know how you do that, but. The Freightliner? <laughs> it's just like a creeper. He's kind of up in the corner watching what's going on down there. Yeah. You know? He's like, <laughs> you know, he's up there slapping this, pissing all over everything. Is it warm yet? <laughs> How did you know the name of the actor? That's right. I know. Did you say his name? Her- Herve Velichos. <laughs> you know what pertinier means? If you know what pertinier means and you live in America, you're a redneck too. Welcome to the Log Talk Podcast brought to you by Pertinier Outdoors. It's that time of year. It's that time of year where we all need to be thinking about, do we have everything we need to hit the woods? Chances are you don't, and if you think you do, you probably could use some more. So how about you go over to thehuntworks.com and check out all the incredible products these guys are carrying. Uh, This is a great family, local store, uh, Dan and Steve Dunnigan, a couple hardworking bitches. They are now carrying archery equipment, everything from bows to arrows to broadheads, quivers, you name it. So on top of all the great tree stands and box blinds that they're carrying, they're now a full, full-on full archery dealer and really recommend that you check these guys out for your next big purchase. Uh, head over to thehuntworks.com to see what they've got for sale, or if you're local in the Rochester area, head on over to their store in East Rochester on Despatch Drive and check them out. They are on social media, The Huntworks, and also online, like I said. And if you purchase anything online, you can use promo code FEEDNEM to get fun. 5% off, and that's F E E D feed in I N U M 5% off. Feed them, brother Dallas. Yeah. How about that for like official production business there, yeah. huh? Yeah, how are you, buddy? Not too bad. You, I'm good. I'm good. Still loving that stress free life, or are you anxious to get back out there and? fill another try to fill another buck tag yeah i'm pretty excited well i'm excited to do that but i'm also going to be very selective i think you know we'll see how it goes but i'd really want to have a buck tag in my pocket come uh come that late season if it if i don't have a chance at a big buck uh during regular gun so yeah i to answer your question yes like it is kind of i'm not hunting the farm at all so i'm kind of excited for some of those sits that i can start having uh, here in a week or so, once uh, once yeah. gun season starts, so I can start kind of pursuing some of those bucks that we got over there. But, um, yeah, long answer, yes. Short answer, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you want to start putting in some time in the, the, the blinds and the food plots and everything. And, uh, you know, like you've been talking the last, well, especially this year, you've been talking about how you want to, you know, you're not too concerned about shooting the biggest buck and, that kind of stuff, you know, but now you got one under your belt. So there's no pressure to, you know, have to fill another tag for any reason, but you want to get that tag back in your pocket so that if you happen to come across a big one, that you'll have the opportunity to do it. Yeah. So, and now you got, you know, our 12 week gun season coming up between the the rifle and the muzzleloader. I mean, you can hunt until from now until next June or whatever. (laughs) Right me a time to get it done yeah yeah no doubt so i i think our what we were what we wanted to break down the night is uh just kind of catch up you and i haven't done a podcast well we did one a live show there the night that uh i shot my buck but then that kind of turned into a bs session with uh with mr ellsworth and uh and and his cohort uh 
Keegan. So we, we kind of had a fun chat there, but we haven't really broke down the season and, uh, and a lot has happened and a lot has not happened since then, um, amongst our group. So, uh, I guess kind of starting off with you, I mean, how, how's your season been so far? It seems like it's been a little bit slow from my perspective, but I, I haven't been there with you on every sit, but it seems like you haven't had too much action. No, it's, <clears throat> it's, it's been kind of a slow year. It's been, uh, slowly ramping up. I've just started putting in time since, you know, Halloween or so. Um, I did a handful of hunts in October, but they were more reconnaissance, checking trail cameras, hanging a stand and getting a few hours in a tree while I was at it. You know, I never had a, I never was seriously on to anything in October. And now I'm not sure I am still, but I've, I've been getting a lot better um, trail cam reconnaissance, you know, in the last couple of weeks with the rut going on. Um, I don't, I still really haven't acquired a true target deer. That's, you know, that's been the disappointment of my season. You know, I, I had high expectations coming into this year based on a couple of bucks that I knew about. Um, one buck that we had pictures of in the summer pretty consistently, but only for about two weeks, you know, that was one that I was hoping to hunt. And then on my other property, I had two bucks that I had super high hopes for that survived last year. And, and I just can't, I just can't locate them. No. So they're, they're just not using the property. And, and the surprising thing is that from like mid October, right through, um, more or less through the, you know, into January, they were consistently on the property last year. And that just goes to show you how, how they shift and how they use different places you know i'm hunting a transitional property which can be fun because it can be really easy to hunt if they are transitioning through that property right but if they're not there's nothing you can do you know i'm hunting a permission property i have no um no ability to do anything other than hang and hunt and and uh, run trail cameras you know i don't have food plots i don't have chainsaw ability anything like that you know i have I can't make them come there. All I can do is wait for them and try to and try to go after them when they're there, you know. So it's I'm still having fun, you know. It's I'm still that's part of the the battle. That's playing the game, you know. Just trying to just trying to wait for the right opportunity to strike. It just hasn't no it hasn't really come. Yeah, I have some periphery deer that I that I would shoot, you know. Um. But you, you're also in the back of your mind. You know, you you know, we've got that late season. We've got the the food plot. We're anticipating that once gun season starts, we're going to start to see some deer move on to our property because of the pressure around that we're trying not to put on our property. I mean, so I, I know you very well, and that you're not in a rush to. Uh, you know, last year was kind of not normal where you shot that big buck with your bow pretty early in October, and that that's not the normal Dallas method of uh of progressing through deer season it's usually a a slow and steady pressure until you uh release the demons once the gun comes out but but it seems like i i it's it's been really fun this is one of the best first week and a half stretches of november that i can remember seeing in years both with our personal friend group and our the guys we hunt with and, and are connected to but also just watching social media it's it's amazing the bucks that really since the first of november you know halloween there was a few there was some good action in the woods but you know once you got into the beginning of november especially like it seemed like the seventh eighth ninth tenth and up through today the 11th there's been some freaking slammer bucks that have been killed and deer that are being seen in daylight on cameras and just driving around things have things have been pretty good this last week to 10 days yeah, no doubt. There's uh, there's been some days where it was pretty predictable too, and and I talked about it a lot, right from mid October. You know, when the we had some good cold weather in early October, and yeah. then as soon as it warmed up again, and you could see that uh, everything kind of went dead. There wasn't a lot. There's there was a few bucks trickling in here and there. I mean, you, you got yours, Andy Bush killed in mid October. There was a few guys, but it it more or less 
it was trickling and you could see that it was, you know, I, I predicted it was like, Oh, it's, it's coming here soon, you know? And it got, you're, I think you're right about November 7th is when it really let loose, which you know, it's going to, because you got a bunch of pent up buck tags just waiting to get filled there, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. amongst a bunch of killers that we know and hang out with and uh, talk to and everything. So this week, you know, starting with, I think uh, your brother and uh, Nick Scott, I think, killed on the same day. Yeah. What that was, that? was, what, the 7th T- or 8th? Tuesday. Tuesday the 8th. Tuesday yep. the 8th. And then uh, um, to, the last two days were the Hunter's Creek Outdoors guys, uh, Scott yesterday, and then Ryan today killed a really big buck. Um, and I'm sure just even just watching the Facebook pages yeah. and stuff like that, you know, you just all of a sudden it's like, oh, yeah. It's time. Yeah, and, and, the, and it's interesting because our cameras, I don't know, it is kind of frustrating because we put so much time and effort and work into our property, and, like, there's just nothing doing. And it's kind of been the way it's been for the last several years I can remember. Um, it's never been a good rut property. No. Never. No. No. You can kill a buck there during the rut if you put in your time. and But most of the ones that we've seen and killed – during the rut have been just on a natural pattern, you know, just mine have been just working to or from food. It seemed, you know, I mean, yeah. I'm sure they're, they're looking for does, but never were they chasing or, or aggressively calling, called them in or anything like that. They just, I just was out in a spot. That's a good spot. And they just wandered by and I shot them, you know, it's just, it's never been a good rut property. And the main reason in my mind is just the fact that it's, it's just, there's no, there's no terrain or natural funnels to, to be able to yeah, concentrate the, that cruising buck. He, he'll just cruise through the property anywhere he wants. And I mean, you've seen him work through properties in the, in the rut where they, they'll just go through, they're not following trails. They're just diagonally cutting through properties, just right. picking up, trying to pick up on scent. And if you don't have anything that can knock that movement down, it, you know, they could be cruising by 75 yards from you and you never have an idea that they're there, you know? Yep. And of course your cameras aren't set up in those weird spots. They're all set up on food or scrapes. Right. Yeah. And in, in comparison to watching what we've got going on, what we've had going on here. And then you look at what I've seen with our, with our Cuddy link system at camp, it's been, it's been wild. And dad, dad's finally gotten some time to be out, uh, basically all week he you know he hunted up until he shot a buck Wednesday morning and uh and the hunts were just were just wild he he was hearing vocalization that he we've he's like I've been hunting <laughs> he's 60 he's been hunting for 45 years and he's like I've never I've never heard continuous sits where I've had bucks vocally grunting and running around and just like roaring and uh I don't know. I don't know what to make of it. And maybe it's just cause he, he's like, maybe it's just cause I'm spending more time because I've got time. So he's sitting yeah. in his box blind right in the middle of the property for hours on end and seeing a lot more, but I don't know. It certainly seems like watching the cameras there. Uh, it's been very interesting to watch the big bucks come and go. And the other night, what was it? It would have been, uh, the eighth going into the ninth. We had, we had one of the big bucks up at camp that we, that we called uncle Tom, because he's got a like kind of like a turkey foot looking deal at the end of his right beam, he's a big mature buck, and he he was fairly frequent during October, and then all of a sudden he just disappeared for like two three weeks, and then now he's he was back that night and just all over the place, and then so was the buck we call Boss Hogs, and he, I don't really know why we call him. It's actually Boss's Hogs. It, it just kind of we named him that at the table. We don't know why we call him that, but. He, uh, cause he's huge and he looks like he's the boss of the mountain, but he, but those two bucks within, it was like a two and a half, three hour window. And they were like crisscrossing these, they weren't together, but they were just like back and forth across the property, hitting the same spots within minutes of each other. It was pretty wild to see. And, uh, but nobody's been back up there to hunt since because dad shot his buck on Wednesday morning and he hasn't, you know, obviously he hasn't been up there to hunt since, but, um, it's been pretty interesting. And I, I see a few comments coming through. And, uh, you know, progressed age class is what Ben said. Ben Jensen said uh, New York has got has come a long way in the past and, and past couple of years a lot more big bucks. Now, I would say, like, this year I haven't seen too many of those. Like, over the last few years we've had a few of those, like, giant, like, 
180 plus inch bucks that have been shot around New York. I don't, I don't think I've, I've seen a couple from down like Long Island that have been some real freaking monsters, but they always shoot some freaks down there. But I'm just seeing like a lot of like good two and a half to three year old deer that people are shooting more consistently than, than the spikes and, and fork horns and year and a half that we're normally seeing all over the place. It's just a lot of like more quality deer that are getting killed. Yeah, I mean, he's right, though. The, the age class is consistently getting better in New York, just people learning that what can happen if they if they just wait a little bit. But I, I think, you know, just as far as what we're not seeing this year is just based on, you know, the state's mirroring what we've, with the experience that we've had this year, is and it's just been a, a little bit of a tough season. There's been some short stretches, like when, when Ben Williams' crew killed out, you know, it's been, there was a little bit of time where the weather was better, but for the most part, it's been a hot, windy bow season. So I think that I'm hoping tomorrow morning is going to be, you know, after all this rain we've had, I'm hoping tomorrow morning, I'm, I'm suspecting you're going to see some pictures of some big bucks hitting the ground. Yeah. Hopefully one nine, but I don't know. I'm not, we'll see. Yeah. Well, I mean, we haven't had precipitation really in, I don't know, since last weekend. I don't even know what's, yeah. so I mean, these deer have got to be thirsty. There's not a lot of water anywhere, but, boy, there is now. I mean, I can't believe how much water there was in ditches and the creeks were ripping. It was pretty cool. Hi, Bill. How are you, bud? Shouldn't you be in bed? Yeah. What's up, Emma? Nothing. Nothing? You got the kids up. The kids are up late. It's Friday night. You guys, you guys are tearing it up. Yeah. So, uh. So what, where are you planning to hunt in the morning? Dallas? Dallas. Colesville. Yeah. In a rut spot. Yep. I've got a, got a, a, a good rut funnel where I've had some good videos and a couple sightings of bucks coming through there. So I feel like at this time, that's just, it's not my favorite way to hunt, just picking a spot and sitting there and waiting. But I feel like it, during the rut, the best, the only way to really hunt is either you, you got to get near does, which I don't really have that opportunity because I don't have good doe bedding on this property. But it's a good, like I said, it's a good transitional cruising property. So I'm just going to pick a, a funnel and sit there in it and put in my time and hope it happens. That's all I can really do at this point. Yeah. So I'm going to go from first light till as long as I can sit tomorrow and then. You know, if I can sit all day, I will. And if, if I get tired or bored or whatever, I'll I'll come out early afternoon and grab her and go sit in a blind at the farm maybe. You know, that could be a fallback plan for the last couple hours of the day. Yeah. It's it yeah. seems like it seems like I mean the morning the mornings have been outstanding this week. I mean everybody that I believe everybody that I know that shot a buck had shot their bucks in the morning. Well, no, Scott shot his at 11.55 um, in the morning. Uh, so the morning's been good, and late morning movement too. You know, seeing a lot of trail cam pictures around at, up at camp in particular, seeing pictures between 9 and 9 and 11, deer cruising through. So, you know, this is this is the time. And that's the part that I'm kind of bumming I'm missing is that I, I do I, – I would love to be able to be out there at this point, but – on the flip side, it's super nice to not have to worry about it. And then, like last, you know, like last night, I wanted to. I haven't hunted. I didn't hunt at all last weekend, so it's been like a week and a half since I hunted. And I wanted to sneak out. I snuck out last night. Um, you know, Sarah and I planned it around the schedule with the kids and what was going on and everything. And I, I went with Jimbo over over to the farm in Livingston County, and and uh, Jimmy put me right in a spot. And he said, he said they're going to come out right here. And he goes, just be ready. <laughs> I was like, okay. Yeah. And it was, he was sitting uh, way back, probably 500 yards away. And he could see me from his stand and he's texting me, you know, he's like, Hey, they're out, they're coming. And I'm sitting there and it was like, it was for being like in a wide open field and one, there's one tree in the corner of this ditch. And it's a massive Oak tree with a ladder stand that we've got. That's, it's just ratchet strapped to it, you know, and you're standing up there, the tree, you're swallowed up by the tree, the deer, they, they have no clue you're there. And, uh, but it's like, you're in such a wide open spot but yet you're like the deer are going to pop out within 10 yards of you and you you got to make a shot cuz they're right there it's wide open and 
they're going to get your wind if they go behind you. So it was it was like pretty nerve wracking doe hunt yesterday, but yeah. it, came, it came together and that doe came through and and I I just I just textbook. I wish I would have had my camera, uh, my GoPro on because you're not going to get a shot much better than that. Like twelve yards broadside, standing in a in a farm road, and uh, let let her eat and she she bucked and went. I double lunged her perfect and. She ran 35 yards, piled up in the woods, and but that's a beautiful. Like I'm so happy that I've had I've had two archery kills this year. Both have been perfect long shots. Deer haven't even they barely left the site. You know they're 50, 60 yards, and I'm just I'm very thankful that I've had two clean kills like that to start the season because it just really starts things out the right way. You know. Yeah, that's there's no better feeling than killing a deer cleanly with an arrow. It's not easy to do. No, but I, I've been telling you guys for a couple of years, it's little Iowa over there. I know exactly where you're hunting. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not it's, fair. It's totally the Midwest there. I mean, they've got a little slice of heaven over there. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it, I drove by that, that, that property for years and years and years. And I always looked at it like, man, that like, look at that place. That's just, I know just hundreds of acres of, of river bottom. Yeah. Yeah, it's river bottom farm ground. It's it's prime. It's good soil. I mean, yeah. it's just like it's just like they cut that out of Iowa and moved it over and dropped it into Western New York. It's pretty cool. Yeah, and and it's it just goes to show. I mean, there's tons of people out there, and this is something that you and I have talked about. I mean, not everybody. The reality is, we, even us. Like, I think a lot of people look at us and say, "Look at the prime hunting land that those guys have to hunt." Like. They're, they've got big bucks running all over the place. It's like, we really don't. I mean, here, like, the hunting's great in Wyoming County, and there's probably some pockets of areas where you've got mature, mature bucks all over the place. But in our block, in our area here, it's it's kind of, there's not a ton of big bucks running around. And there's a decent amount of deer, but the deer population is not that great. But you go over there to Livingston County, to that area, and it's just, it's absurd. I mean, Jimmy, Jimmy told me last night, cause I couldn't see him. And Jimmy told me when we met up afterwards, he's like, he goes, there was 20 deer in that field and 16 deer in that field. Not including, yeah. the, not including the two that I shot or the one that I shot. It's well, just, what's crazy. It, it really is crazy because of like, if you, if you just go on a, um, aerial map, just, um, you know, a Google map and just zoom, zoom out to the whole Livingston County, it's nothing but fields and roads and hedgerows and, and creeks and rivers. I mean, it's just it's amazing that, and it's, I always think the same way. Like when you, I never been to Iowa, but you watch it on TV and it's like, man, these guys are sitting in one single Oak tree in a hedgerow, like you're saying. And there's very little, there's no cover anywhere, small blocks, you know, everything is farmed other than that little bit of drainage or, or ravine that you can't get a corn planter into, you know? And yet we have all sorts of cover and food and everything, but we just, I mean, there used to be very high deer numbers in Wyoming County like 15, 20 years ago. And we took care of that by shooting them all. But, you know, out, it's, it's, just, it's just very interesting to watch the whitetail's habitat and what they can th- – what kind of situation they thrive in, you know. For sure. And, and then how, 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 they, how, they, how they change and evolve to that. You know, where, where we're hunting in Livingston County is – outside of a village and the deer they've totally learned to adapt to that and that's part of how they survive is by using the village during the day and then they come out into the ag land all in the surrounding areas yeah i'm gonna hook this up so you can be part of the conversation all right bill you just be patient so it it is pretty amazing last night though that uh the doe and she she jumped right in the drainage ditch she walked the drainage ditch all the way down to me and then came out of the drainage ditch in the corner once she got to a point where there was some cover. So she was kind of protecting herself so that she could, uh, you know, stay in, in cover and not just walk down a wide open, you know, farm road. So, I mean, it, it's as, it's as in-depth as that, how they do it. But so what are your, uh, what are your game plans for, I mean, we're basically – we got the la- this last weekend, and then we got gun season coming up. What, what are your uh, what are your game plans or expectations for opening weekend of gun? Shoot the deer. <laughs> Emma has spoken. <laughs> yeah. So, I think we're going to approach opening day a little bit different this year. 
similar to last year, but um, usually Brian and Molly historically have always hunted the farm in the morning on opening day. But I think if I can talk Dad into coming with me, my my spot in Coesville is a good morning spot. So I think me and him are going to go to Coesville, and Brian and Molly are going to go to Pavilion to her parents' house on Friday night. And then so they're going to stay over there, go hunting in the morning, and they hunt right near the house. So they can just hunt till whatever it's time to come in and then grab the kids, have lunch, whatever. And then I think we're all going to reconvene at the cabin at like early afternoon. And, you know, hopefully we'll be celebrating the morning's kill already, but if probably if nothing else that, and that's what we did last year, we all met at the cabin at like two o'clock or one o'clock or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then we all dispersed into the, the blinds for uh afternoon food plot haunts at the farm. So I'm trying to keep, I don't like going in there open. You know, the farm is not a very good morning spot to begin with, but especially opening day, I, I think it's stupid to go in there and potentially bump deer out of fields or wood lines and have them run over to the neighbors and get shot when we're better off just killing them in the fields in the afternoon anyways. You yeah, know? agreed. So I'd been saying for a couple of years, like, I don't know if it's really the best idea. It, it used to be like, hey, it's a good spot. Let's just get up in there and hunt. But I actually really just think now I'd rather see nobody in there on a, a morning hunt at the farm on, on opening day because you know damn well everybody in the county's out around there hunting. So it's like, why... Why do anybody else a favor, you know? Let them run in and, and bed there for the day, and then we'll get them in the afternoon. Yeah. that's. I was telling, I was talking, I had a, was chatting with Brian last night, you know, kind of about the same theory. It's that, you know, I think the more that we can, we've got, we have a lot of different places that we can hunt and spread out our our efforts, and we know what we're trying to do is have a have a late season, you know, honey hole where these deer have got the food and everything, the habitat, the cover that we've worked so hard over the last two years to create. You know, we've got a lot of the a lot of the undergrowth and, and things that we've repopulated so that we've got those thickets that they can get back into and hunker down once the pressure's on and they need to recharge the batteries after the rut. Like I really think we've got that. I'm I'm hoping based on what we've seen the last two winters, the deer that have come back in and how heavily they're hanging on our property with the food and it seems like that's the spot where the bucks are coming back to. A lot of these deer we haven't gotten pictures of, you know, in a couple months or we haven't seen in person. Like, I'm really hoping they show their faces back here once we get into December. That's yeah, that's my hope. One in particular. <laughs> yeah, for sure, one in particular. Oh, where is he? I, I think if he was killed, I think we would know about it. Yeah, I don't think he's dead. I think he's just... I think he he just doesn't live on our property, but I, yeah. I think how did he how did he get to be the size that he is without you know he's obviously got a spot that he's that he lives that nobody goes yeah you know he's he's living unmolested somewhere. I just wish the food on that side of the road was better. I thought it was going to be, but it yeah our de our, our deer farmer really failed us. I think this fall in a couple areas. <laughs> the best the best food we had on that side of the road was right against was right against the road and you kind of had to cut it down you know but yeah well the all the soybeans and cow peas that were really do, thriving there during the summer at the end of the year the weeds kind of took them over and kind of there's still some there but it's not what i thought it was going to be um there's still food there yeah it's just I just don't think it's going to be highly attractive. And then that, that lower plot was good for a while too, but a couple of deer camped out in there all summer and ate every damn soybean. And they, they ate every stalk off the corn in there too. It's like yeah. They just, they just, uh, just crushed all the corn in there too. So yeah, I mean, there's a limited us, amount of food there too. Us not having corn on the farm planted in big fields anymore has really made it difficult to grow corn because the deer just, they target yep. it as soon as it starts coming up, and they just eat it. It's gone. It, like, we had a little bit of corn last year, but this year we don't have really shit to show for. Um, sweet yeah. corn went nice, but we ate all that. So, Yeah, well, that came out good at least. It did come out good. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm pretty excited about, about next weekend. I'm going to go back up to my, to my opening day spot that I've had the last few years, and, um, and I – I have, I really have no, no intel. I, I did put one cell camera up, up there. Excuse me, Bill. 
Did you have something to say? No? No? What are you what are you you getting stage fright, are you? No. Um so I put a trail camera up. I've only gotten like one picture of a deer and it was a big buck. Like a real big buck. And uh okay. yeah, and he was with the doe, um, right? It's a big signpost rub that I found and uh and I I've, I've been thinking about it nonstop since I found it last winter. And I just ran up there and put a camera on it. I, I wanted to see what was coming through that area. And I'm not getting a lot of movement through there, at least what I'm getting on camera. But the only deer that I've gotten was a huge buck. So I know that there's a big buck in that area. And um, I'm fairly confident that, you know, we'll have another repeat of what I had the last couple of years in that spot with the pressure from neighboring properties and stuff. So I'm going to get up there. and I'm going to whack a couple by about 9 o'clock. And then I'll spend the rest of the day packing them out. And then I'll I'll head back to camp at night and hang out with the boys, drink some beers, and then move along. Yeah, I mean, if for anyone who doesn't know you, that might sound kind of optimistic. But the, the <laughs> fact of the matter is that it's kind of realistic. Yeah, that's, so, that spot has been so productive. Yeah. I mean, that's one of those situations where when you learn a spot like that, I mean, we like to bounce around and hunt all different places and be mobile and everything else. But, man, when you figure out a spot, just – keep going back to the well you know there's no reason not to yeah and and for anybody so i i've hunted this this spot on opening day whoa bill are you trying to listen if your mother says it's time to go to bed it's time to go to bed it's like it's like 35 40 minutes past your bedtime you're gonna pay for this tomorrow if you don't go to bed it's not gonna be good Oh, boy. Wow. Look at that smile. Yeah. You're trouble. Listen, listen. You got to go to bed because we're going to Grandma and Grandpa's tomorrow. And we don't want to be tired and unhappy when we go to Grandma and Grandpa's, okay? You can sit with me in the afternoon when I'm blind. Bill. Good night, bud. Go with Mom. You did a great job. You did awesome. Your first, your first live podcast, Bill. Give me a high five. Well, Emma, what do you want to talk about? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe that my dad hasn't shot at deer yet. And both season has been like. Yeah. Yeah. I don't usually shoot a lot of deer with a bow. It's very more... picky man. Yeah, I try to be more about uh, quantity than quality, unlike my brother, who's about both. But, uh, mm, both? Yeah, well, know. he shoots good bucks with a bow, really good bucks, but wow. he shoots a lot of doe too. But yeah, my thing with with it is that if uh, if you don't make a good shot, uh, like a perfect shot with a bow, you end up spending all day and all night trying to track them down. Or yeah, I know a couple you know, people. Who sometimes you got warm year. weather that you have to deal with, so then when you do find them, you have to worry about whether. You know, find them fast enough and get them in a cooler and whatnot. And then you go to cut up your deer, and you got one deer, and nobody else is around, so you end up doing the whole thing by yourself. So to me, I don't like to, I don't like to shoot too much with a bow without, it, unless it's really, unless I feel like it's really a deer worth shooting. So that's that's always been my approach to bow season. I'll take a doe if I get a really good shot at it. You know, something a good clean shot, I'll take it. But I don't. It's just so easy to kill does with a gun and pile them up. Just deer stupid. Plus, you're usually hunting with me with a gun a lot of times, so you like to shoot stuff when we go hunting. So yeah. if I burn all my tags early on, then... It's boring. <laughs> yeah. So I try to be strategic about it. I don't know. We still got some venison left from last year. Actually, on that note, it's kind of funny. Last week, I went to grab a roast out of the freezer and found out... I knew I had a box of meat left... And when I pulled the box, I had one box of meat, and I pulled it out, and it's all loins. It's all back straps. <laughs> really? Some of, it's, some of it's even tenderloins. So here I thought I had a, a mix of everything. So I, I go upstairs last week because we wanted to make a crock pot. And uh, usually I use a roast for that. That's kind of what I do with most of my roasts. <laughs> and so I went upstairs, and I told Jen, I'm like, oh, it turns out all we got left is back straps. So I guess somebody fire up the grill here pretty soon. So. 
it's actually a pretty good situation to be in because you know you kind of want to use up all your deer meat before the next season but that stuff ain't it's not going to go to waste so not no. worried about that no no, it's a it's a beautiful thing, and then it's that it's that point of the year where all of a sudden you're you start shooting deer, and then you start looking in your freezer, and you're like, oh man, uh, we probably shouldn't have put the paws on eating venison like we did because now we're starting to stock back up again. But it's a that's a good problem to have, I think. Um, yeah. And that's I like I shot that doe I shot that doe last night, and there was never a doubt in my mind I was going to shoot her. But you know now now I'm in a now I'm in a boat where I'm going to end up probably butchering her probably Monday night and Tuesday night. I'll probably work on her and get that done. And then, you know, I'll be Thursday night getting ready to go to camp for the weekend and then be gone Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And I hope to shoot a deer or two or three opening weekend. And I'm going to have all that work to do. So it'll be, it'll be exhausting, but that's the fun part of season is, is all the work you put in. I do, I, I don't, what are your thoughts about, like, I did, I haven't cut with you guys at all in the last couple of years, and I think Brian's been cutting a lot of his own stuff, but what do you think about, you know, getting back together and doing some, doing a couple cut nights here during the first couple of weeks of season when we've got a bunch of deer? Yeah, no, we should. Pete wants to do that yeah. in the worst way. He wants us to use his barn. The problem is we never... Well, one problem is like Brian and Brad and some of the guys were kind of getting away from doing that to begin cutting with the group to begin with. But, yeah. Um, the problem in Pete's is we still don't have running water out there, which we he has a, a water line run out there from his house. Thank you. But we need to, you know, and I told him I would help him get a sink. He's, he has a sink and I think he has a water heater. So we need to get that all working and we just haven't done it yet because me, neither me nor Pete has the time to really do it so we you know we probably need to make it a priority maybe either this fall or this winter to just get a few of us together for a weekend get that all done because he has he has the cooler he has the table he has counter space he has um a he has a um a winch so like we have almost everything we need to have a real good cutting operation but when you can't wash your hands, and especially with hot water, it, no. and when you can't clean off a table, you know, have water to clean off a table and that, it just, it really hinders the operation. So if we can get that going, we'd be a lot better off. Yeah, agreed. And a couple comments coming through here, you know, cutting with your buddies is the best. And that, I mean, those were some great memories. We we haven't done it. 2020 was it was a year where a lot of things changed for obvious reasons, but we also lost the, you know, lost the barn there at the farm where we were doing at the shop where we, yeah. we had the big group of 10, 15 guys during gun season. It was just, I mean, we'd cut 10, 12 deer a night, you know, it was for a couple of weeks there, it was pretty wild. And, yeah. uh, but now it's like, I kind of am feeling like I want to get back into, you know, at least the first couple of weeks of season, even if we don't have the water, the running water in that to clean up, like. You know, we can, yeah, we can, we can, we can we do it. Do it's it. just difficult. So I don't know for me, for me, Tuesdays and Thursday nights, I think are probably the two best nights of the week. I don't know what your schedule looks like, but, um, I don't think it matters to me anymore. Any night is, you know, and I think people got sick of having to dedicate it one night a week or two nights a week to doing it. But in reality, when you, when you kill one deer yourself and you have to do the whole thing yourself, you spend three nights doing it right. instead of one. So why not do six or eight deer in one night instead of spending three nights to do one deer as far as I'm concerned. So, cause I know I, <laughs> I processed four deer mostly by myself. Pete helped me a little bit. John helped me on my buck. But I mean, you shit, you shoot a, a big buck that dresses out at 160, 180 pounds. I mean, there's meat for days there. Yeah. You just cut and cut and cut. You can't believe how much meat is in even a, you know, when we're doing it, um, rapid style at the shop like you, you even notice when you get a just a two-year-old buck it's like holy crap there's a lot of meat on this deer yeah. I mean then you know but even just the does that you shoot if you're doing it by yourself I mean I can actually I'm pretty good at the skin and quarter portion of things that's what I prefer I can I think I can skin and quarter without hustling in a, in a half hour and have it all on the table ready to go 
but then when you turn around and you have to sit there and trim and cut and trim and cut and package and package and package, yeah, it's, man, it's a lot of work on that end of things. And that's even without grinding usually. Yeah. You know, usually I'm saving mine up to the end to grind now too. So yeah, yeah, I definitely want to get back to doing that. I always enjoyed that, even though it's sometimes it was hard for me before with I work nights plus with the kids and stuff, but now my evenings are a little more free. I, I definitely can free up time to do that. So, okay. yeah, I'm all for, you know, next week starting that up again because, you know, we're all going to shoot a bunch of deer. So let's just, you know. Yeah, we, we should, should almost just set a night now with the with our little core group here. We should just set a night here, the you know, in the first after the first week, the week of Thanksgiving. There. It, Tuesday would kind of make sense if we did Tuesday because – you know, we we want to get anything we got over the weekend. Try to get that cut before uh, get that cut before Thanksgiving because there'll be more deer shot then. So yeah. I don't know, just something to think about with you, me, and Brian, and and uh, and uh, PMH. And, yeah, we should definitely talk to Pete because I know the last that you know he's just like we were at our shop where we never would clean or prepare for anything until it was you know <laughs> twenty five minutes ready. before. It's, now, oh shit we better organize and clean up here you know of course it you know it's kind of the same story yeah. as always but that's fine i mean it's it's it you know not only is it way more efficient but it is more fun in my opinion to get us all together and do it you know and now you know you said the world kind of fell apart there in 2020 just because it was 2020 but also that's when we didn't have the farm anymore so right uh, yeah yeah, we'll get back. I think that's good. I'm, we're on the same page here. We'll get back to that. Um, any more thoughts uh, Thoughts given to PA, what your game plan is, what our game plan is going to be for that hunt? It's going to be It's gonna be on top of us before we know it. It's like, yeah, I know. It's like 18 days away. Yeah. So I'm struggling a little bit because we thought we were going to have like 20-plus people, so that's why we went to the third house. And we talked about splitting up into two groups. And I, I never loved that idea because I'd rather just be together and be, I think the right number for a drive usually down there is 12 to 14. So like if you split up into, okay, so anyways, we're, when we thought we were at 20, I just told you, Hey, I think we got to split up and hunt two groups, right? Yeah. Essentially that's going to be you taking a group and me taking a group. I didn't love it, but I felt like it's the right thing to do. It's just too hard to put 20 people in one area, you know? So then we lost. We felt like the number was back down to 16. Well, now I think we're at 18 again. So now I'm I'm kind of in the air about what I want to do there. I think, I think there might be a day where we s- split up and go at it in two groups. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> next year. Soon enough. Soon enough, Emma. You got to you got to start training if you're going to do that. Keep up what? with your dad. I do that. Oh, do you? Sometimes. <laughs> so definitely super excited as always. A couple of new guys that I'm excited to have with us. Um, it's just it's going to be. It's just going to be to determine what kind of hunts we want to do as, as far as how many people we can get in there and how we're going to hunt it. I, I've got some ideas of where to put extra guys as far as, like, two years ago we were big on having the uh, – two or three years ago we did the uh, kickback guys there for a lot of the hunts where you kind of had somebody following up the drive, and they never shot anything. But we, it's kind of just in case, but it seems like where if you get a big buck, that's what they do. Mm-hmm. So I feel like we should probably bring that strategy back. And then the sitters, maybe instead of putting them at the top of the valleys, put them more like on the finger ridges and have them on both sides because you can never see down both sides. On a map, it looks like you could stand on the top and see over both ways, but you can't. You need no. two guys there. Yep. And then the creek bottom guys, you know, definitely have one or maybe even two shooters down there. So there's adjustments to be made. Um. I just look at uh, it's just hard. To, it's harder to coordinate that amount of people and have them be able to go and, especially when it comes to like finishing one hunt and setting up for another one. You know, yeah. The logistics just get more and more difficult, which is 
I'm not complaining about it. I'm just debating how to do, you know, just how. That's all. Yeah. And I, and like I say, I mean, I, I want <clears throat> to eventually enough, there's going to be a, like, I think we're getting to the close to the point where we got to say, like, we don't probably need to invite a whole lot more people. Like if there's people that are already part of our group that want to go, like if your brother wants to show up, he's invited. If yeah. Tard wants to come back, he's invited, you know, like there's, but I, you know, we, we, yeah, the, the she's looking at me because the kids are going to start coming yeah. at some point too. So we're not too far away from that in all reality. So even our, so I think we can stop recruiting now and just be our group, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's fun. And we can certainly like you and I were challenged with that because it's when people, you know, we don't want to tell people no, and we don't want, if somebody wants to come and experience that, you know, it's, it's yeah. public land. It's like, yeah, you, you don't want to just tell people, no, you can't. And it's not that you can't, it's that it's getting difficult, obviously, to plan hunts for that many people and cover that many miles and try to have everybody in the right places and doing the right things for, most importantly, for safety reasons. And, uh, but I, I, it, it's gotten to be difficult on my end, too, because you, you, you do a lot of the mapping planning, and I've kind of taken on the, the housing responsibility. So now I've got three houses through Airbnb that are on my credit card and I'm responsible for, and I don't mind doing it, but then when you've got situations and it's totally understandable, like life happens, schedules change, but you got people moving and coming and going, like I can go, I can't go, I don't know if I can, I probably will, but I don't know if I can or not. Like that's really difficult when you're in the situation of like not so much as trying to plan a drive, but like what's our expenses going to be to this trip and who who needs a bed to sleep on? So yeah. it's, I mean, we, we've, we've got a huge group. And I love our group, and I, I love where it's gone. But we definitely got a. I think I think this is a year here where we've got we have a couple new guys, but we've got a pretty solid group of of returning guys that know what to do, and those that are you know like Jim D is only one year in, but he had quite the crash course last year, and kind of now gets what we're doing and understands the the strategy behind it all. So I'll. Uh, you know that that's that's what it comes down to, but it's it's the best. I can't wait. It's the it's like I'm excited for next weekend, but I'm ten times more excited for Pennsylvania. Yeah, yeah. it's the yeah, best. Because the, the best. The opening day thing here, like it, it's exciting when it come when it's coming, but it, it wears off fast. The Pennsylvania thing is more lasting. But uh, it is it the whole. It's always a challenge, and I'm always up for a challenge. You know me, I don't like any routine or you know, doing the same thing over and over. I always like, whether it's hunting or work or just life in general, I can always adapt and survive, you know? So like the whole, um, you know, the new people, the bigger group, all that stuff's fun. I mean, because if you look at Pennsylvania, the history of our hunt, just since you've been there and you can imagine what it was like before that, but as we, as our group has gotten bigger and, and we've gotten to, you know, do different things. Like if you look at a lot of the new hunts we've done, a lot of the new places we've gone, the new houses that we've been in. Like I mean, from going from when we stayed in a hotel. Did you ever do that? Oh yeah, I did that for two years. Yep. Yeah. Like we thought we had it made back then, and now look at how much better it is. Oh, you know? it's amazing. Yeah. And then we go to that first house, and it's like a forty-minute drive to where we hunt, which is insane, you know. But that's where we had. It was a good. We loved it. You yeah. know. Now we're 10 minutes from where we hunt, and we have three houses now, yep. which we had two last year. Now we have three. The things just keep getting better and better and better. But with that comes new challenges that you have to adapt to, you know, you have to figure out these new things. So that's part of the fun of it for me, though, you know. Certainly, that's, yeah. That's what I enjoy. And then when And then when things come together, you know, be it, for the housing and the meals or the, or the, you know, particularly the hunts, you know, when you, when things come together and people have success, and especially I think when new people have success, it's like, it's, it, that's where it becomes really rewarding. You know, when you either, when you bring a new guy with you and, and he kills a buck or just, just comes and has a great time and just wants to come back. Or even when you got, 
older guys like Chris and Pete killed their first bucks last year. I mean, those guys have been going to Pennsylvania for a long time. Yeah. Never killed before. Did last year. You know how satisfying that is? Oh, it's to, to, to walk up on year, to, to walk up on Crispy with that buck and and I was I whether that was the buck that I was I was behind or not in that in that clear cut to like to be pushing through that clear cut and I could smell that buck like it I've never I've never smelled a buck like that in the woods. I mean, I've smelled them, but to have one that strong and to know that you're that close to him in a clear cut where you can't see 10 feet in front of you, like I was on the ass of that deer or at least very close to it. And then to hear the gun go off and, you know, Chris Chris comes over the radio and says, I got a buck down. And it's like, it's just the greatest feeling ever in an area we've never been before, never set foot there, no clue what's on the ground. To produce yeah. two bucks in that one drive was just outstanding. And I, I can't, I, that's the stuff you just can't, beat with that group style hunt like that that i think right. that's that's something you know we talk about a ton on this podcast that's something that i really hope like our generation gets back into because or, or starts to do more of again because that's the tradition of hunting that is so strong in our in in the north american culture is the group hunting is going out has the camp atmosphere you know like the the individual trophy hunter style like I totally respect it but it just doesn't do it for me like I I don't want to go and spend a seven days hunting by myself targeting a specific buck and stressing about it like I've tried inversions to do that but it's just not me like I love going with my brother and hunting for an hour and a half before dark after work and putting a hunt together and killing a doe like it's the best you know I'm standing there under a perfect clear sky Last night, we're standing up there on this ridge. Trucks are all loaded up, you know, just pounding fists, fired up that, like, we just, we had success, and you're standing out there. It's a freaking 65-degree night, not a cloud in the sky, stars everywhere. It's like, freaking doesn't get any, it doesn't get any better. You know, this is yeah. why we love these three months out of the year. And, and right. I just, I want to see people, like, we talk so much about this because I want to make sure that people understand how attainable it is to put a group of people together, and it can start, with three, four guys or even two people. And it turns into, it'll grow and it'll grow very quickly because everyone, once they learn what you're doing and how much fun you're having, they want to be there and be with you doing it. So anybody can do what we're doing. And, uh, and that's why we talk so much about it. I want to encourage people to get out there and do it. Yeah. I really want to say that like, you know, like in both styles of hunting, do it for me, you know, the Solo bow hunting is, is a lot of fun, too, but I think part of it is it just wears on you after a while. You just want to get back to your buddies. But I wasn't even thinking of it, but you just brought it up. You're right. Like, even just going hunting with your brother, because I do, me and Brian do the same thing. Like, we'll hunt by ourselves so much, or he'll hunt with Molly or whatever, but then we'll get together for one hunt. And even if we don't shoot something, it's just like, it's it's just more fun when you get out of the, you know, you, you uh go to the woods together and come out together and you talk about what you see or didn't or what strategy or this or that. Like even that's a little bit of a group hunt, but what we're doing in our big groups is just kind of, we're bringing back the old style of hunts and like they, that sort of hunting has gone away in such large part, both because there's less hunters, but also because it's kind of a taboo style of hunting now, you know, where people really look down on this a lot of times, you know, and they, especially in Western New York, people in Western New York, and I get it, I know a lot of the reasons why they hate the, that style of hunting, you know, but that's like the on the private lands where people are just trashing private lands with, you know, big group style hunts and doing drives and stuff. Like, I understand why people don't like that, but if you really take it back, think back 20, 30, 50 years and think of why that style of hunting got so popular, it's because of hunting camps and groups and families, you know, hunting and was, together. And people were hunting for meat, and that's the most productive way to get your deer killed quickly. You know, you look at somebody Absolutely. like you look at somebody like Mike. He doesn't. Ha he works seven, this time of year working sixty, seventy hours a week on the farm. He doesn't have time. Like he he as bad as he would want to archery hunt, he can't because he doesn't have time. And when it comes to gun season, they're still ripping and roaring in November and December on the farm, and he's like. You know, we talk about, man, you got to go and just sit the evenings, Mike, or you got to go out and just sit. And he's like, I don't have time. I have time on Saturday morning and Sunday morning to go do drives until 10 a.m. and I have to go home. 
because he's gone all week long. Yeah. Go back to him. Yeah, and he and he'll he'll kill all the deer he needs to in you know two weekends, and that's some... that's what our our and like our grandfathers and great grandfathers and our even our fathers like that's what they grew up on. It wasn't you know oh yep yeah, I'm waiting for 150 incher this year. It was no I'm going out <laughs> like we're going deer hunting because I want to put two or three deer in the freezer so I have meat to eat all year. That was the reason. It wasn't. Yeah. It wasn't the commercialized thing that it is today. So, um, yeah. it's like it brings back this primitive, uh, like this primitive feeling when when we all get out there together and we have that success and you're and you're packing out meat and you're doing things that like ninety five percent of hunters aren't doing. It's just like it totally scratches an itch that you can't. Yeah, you just can't do it any other way. Yeah, quartering a deer and packing it out in your backpacks kind of is a primal feeling, you know, like that's, um, that makes you feel like, I don't know, like on one hand, sometimes there's a, like the deer drives and rifle hunting and stuff like that. I know it's a little, it can feel a little cheap sometimes. I, it doesn't feel that way to me, but I think from an outsider's view or a lot of, I've said it before, like, Again, I, I love bow hunting too, but a lot of bow hunters, you know, where they like the people that's all that they do, they think this this like, you know, it's trashy type of hunting, like, but it's there's so much more to it. You know, being in the backwoods, hunting with your friends and your family, having to go you know, they don't realize the lengths that we have to go through and where we have to what do we have to put ourselves through to get in a position to kill a deer let alone to pack it out and get it back into the truck like it's just a whole different style and that's that's what keeps it fresh for us too you know you start out october 1st you're all set free and hanging your stands in these cautious locations and trying to catch deer near their bedding areas coming out to food and, and then it gets december and you're like Let's go. <laughs> yeah, like, let's I, have, go. <laughs> I haven't washed my camo in a month. It's covered in blood and hair. And... I don't care. <laughs> no. It's so true. It's so it's, true. That's what keeps it fresh for us the whole season. Like, you know, we're, I'm just, I'm more excited on December 18th to wake up and go do a public land hunt with you and AJ and Brian and these guys. Like, I'm more excited about that shit than I am tomorrow morning on November 12th, you know, you think like most guys are getting, not most, but let's just say a lot of people are like, they're getting worried because their season, what's left of their season is from now until opening day of gun. And after opening day, the sun sets and their season's over. They're like, oh, I got no chance. This is hunting's going to shit now, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I don't look so, at it that way. I no. look at it. The season's just getting started once the, once the gun comes out. Yeah, and I definitely. I mean, I think I, over the last last year, I didn't shoot anything with my bow. I didn't even have opportunity, and it just goes to show. Like, I hunted. I've been keeping logs. I'd have, I'd have to pull it up and look at it. But last year, I hunted. I think like I had like fifteen sits during archery last year, and I I didn't have a single shot opportunity at anything at a buck or a doe. Nothing. Um, I saw a deer, but not opportunity. This year, I've got six sits in. And I've shot two deer, and it's like it just has come together easily and it's, it's a lot of it is luck you know is it being in the right place at the right time the weather conditions lined up and picking and choosing your days you know I, I easily could have that many days in if I was pushing it and trying to go out there every single moment that I could and there's people that go out there and on those days when it's not ideal 70 degrees the last several days and there's dudes shooting giant bucks so it can get it can happen but I still think you can, you know, you hunt around those fronts, you hunt around those times when you can predict that the weather's going to be advantageous and, you know, capitalize on your situations. And I fortunately did that this year. It doesn't mean I'm going to do it every year, but, you know, you get those chances. It's no different than you last year. You know, you had that big buck that you shot with your bow, biggest inches buck you've ever killed. It just, it happened very quickly. <laughs> you were after a different deer and it just came together and happened. So everybody, everybody looks from afar and sees, you know, sees people that are killing deer and, and just assume that they're, you know, that you assume a lot of things, but you don't know all the work that goes into it. And you don't know the, the time and effort really in the off season. And I, I, I feel, I feel for guys that, that go out there and grind 
and don't have the opportunity, and I know they put the time in, and they just it just never happened for them. There's a lot of good hunters that just it just never comes together, and that's just the reality. If you're a good hunter, it'll come together eventually. Not every year, but you know, there's a I think a misconception that a lot of people have is that time in the stand will kill deer or bucks, you know, and yeah, it will if you're doing it right, but don't just keep going, you know, definition of insanity, right? Just keep trying the same thing over and over with expecting different results and won't work. Like you can grind it. You can spend a lot of hours in the stand, but you need to be adapting to your situation yeah. and trying to, you know, like I said, I mean, this is the beauty of whitetail hunting, right? So this this property that I hunt in Coesville, I've been zoning in on that place for four years. I've been making adjustments, and last year it all came together for me, right? The, the last two years. Cause yeah, I, you shot that big buck with the brow tines, I, right? Yeah, yeah, I shot the, the big brow tine 10-pointer with my rifle on December 7th or whatever it was, 2020. And that was a, the culmination of a couple of years of – of hunting that property and, and using cameras and, and moving around, bouncing around to different spots and, and having it come together. And then the following year with the bow, I killed the big buck and I was on to a, a couple other big ones. And I used that information going forward into this year and guess what? None of it's worked. <laughs> so, but if I had just, settled last year and said oh i got it figured out now i know the spot here's where i got to go every time i'd be sitting up there not seeing any deer ever right you know and have i killed anything yet this year no i haven't but I've, i'm using the intel and the past experience but you can't take that past information for gospel it's going to change every year the white-tailed deer that's what i say they're so adaptable that you can't ever, you have to use past information for your, you know, be stupid not to, to take into consideration what's happened in the past, but you need to adapt it all the time. You need to understand what's going on around you and adapt to it. Yeah. Adapt and just get ebbing and flowing with the season, you know, taking crops being harvested. How does that change things is, you know, you got mass crop, you don't have mass crop. You can't, you can't just keep doing like, for example, my the the piece of property, the piece of public that I hunt, there's no acorns this year, and that again, and that so it's two straight years, no acorns again in that entire valley. I'm not like I said, I, I got everything. Yeah, like I said, I, especially in in the mountains where you have no ag, it changes everything. And I, I'm I'm gonna hunt their opening day because of the hunting pressure, and I. And I know that I will have opportunity or at least see deer. I'll have opportunity in that spot on opening day. After that, it's a, it's a pressure spot without the pressure. That spots, nothing. I, I, you won't see deer, maybe a deer or two every sit, but you're not going to see anything. That's a, pre, it's a pressure pinch point for opening day. Right. Other than that, I, you, I don't right. think I'm going to hunt that unless there's snow where I can get up yeah. there and try to cut tracks and, and track deer. I'm not going to waste my time because you're just not going to have the predictable feeding patterns and deer just all over the damn place because you got food everywhere. So that's, that's key though. You identify what type of property it is that you're hunting yeah. and, and you realize the, what's going to, what's going to make the changes for that. So that's like your, your point there about the acorns has just made me think that this, my, my property this year is, I knew coming into the season that it was going to be different. I knew things were going to change because last year in late October, I realized why things were so good for me is because I took a drive up to the north end of that block and realized that all the fields up there, all the crop fields had been wheat. And they so wheat they harvest in August or July, right? And just the, the conversation we were having with Keith Burns, how we were talking about how farmers miss an opportunity by not planting anything after the wheat, any cover crops or a second crop or whatever. Well, that's what they did. There was several hundred acres of wheat fields that had gone fallow. So they never, never planted any follow up, no cover crops, nothing. So half of the block that I was hunting had no food on it and it was a bad acorn year. So that's part of the reason why I had so, so much success last year was because of the crops. So I, but I knew going into this year, 
that was going to change. And then, of course, I went up there in the summer and saw that it was all corn. So it's like, okay, big, big red flags here. I know that that's going to change my hunting. So in a way, I'm not shocked that I've had more difficulty this year, but I've been able to recognize why. And that makes a difference too. Yeah. It doesn't help me. <laughs> no, it doesn't help you, but you can, you can understand why you're not seeing what you're expecting to see. Yeah. And, and that's, that's a that's huge, a that's a big deal. And once as a hunter, once you can start putting the pieces together, it makes a lot of this much simpler because, and that's the benefit of these podcasts. It's the benefit of YouTube. It's a benefit of networking on social media and meeting some of these people. You start to kind of put the pieces together and this thing, it's, it's still very challenging, but it becomes much easier when you, you can start to put the pieces together on why, why, what is happening is happening. And I've seen, it's been interesting to me being that I'm also not in the fight right now. I don't have a buck tag. So it's, uh, oh, your wife is, we're not going to identify your wife's Facebook comment right now. I don't know. I'm not going to try to read it because it's a paragraph, and I think she's trying to say something about you and your efforts and the time you put into Pennsylvania. We don't need any marital issues on this podcast. That's not what it's here for. So she can address that with you after this discussion is over. <laughs> but um, anyway, uh, see, Jen, look at now. Now I don't remember. I don't even remember. What, where was I going? Where was I'm I going? Facebook, so I have no idea what she's talking. I didn't know she was even watching. So she's talking smack about how much time you take, and or maybe she's complimenting you. I'm not quite sure. Yeah, what? yeah, she's complimenting me. All right, she's had a couple drinks tonight. So that's, you know. Yeah. Okay. That's different. Than- Damn it, Jen! You derailed me. I was I was on a heater. I was saying something, and now I don't remember where I was going. Uh, what was I talking about, Emma? Were you were you paying attention, or do you just see my lips moving and can't? hear what i'm saying i don't know i just sit here and make face expressions (laughs) yeah you're good at that you get that from your mother um all right i I don't don't know where the hell i was going it's good shit though oh trail cam pictures being that i'm not out there hunting right now and i'm not worried about being out there i'm i'm kind of paying attention to the pictures and also paying attention to historical pictures and i save i i save all my trail cam pics to whether it's my OneDrive or Google Drive, so I get, or my even Amazon Photos, I got a bunch of stuff on there too, so I get all these, like, emails and notifications of memories, and it's pretty wild seeing how consistent it is. It's not every year, but it's pretty consistent that it's, it is those 7th, 8th, 9th of November. I get a ton of daylight pictures of bucks that I've got saved from over the years, so it's, that's also the other thing, you know, taking, taking experience that you start putting together and a lot of those pictures go back 10 years that i'm seeing and uh it's just kind of cool to see the the trends and and consistencies there which we all know but for me i'm like i've had most of my success killing deer at the end of october at the end of october so i've like always focused around halloween because that's when we see the most deer activity but it's not mature bucks it's two-year-olds and yearlings and uh so that's you know that's uh well that's wait. a good segue because you want to know what grinds my gears billy i do i do let's grind something yep okay. trail cameras okay trail cameras grind my gears they're like women you can't live with them and you can't live without them <laughs> so i'm at the point where i rely on them so much and i enjoy them so much that that's that's the way I hunt but this year in particular I mean I've had these same problems but this year in particular I'm really struggling with my I feel like we've gotten a better handle on the cuttyback system over the last couple of years but we still know that there that it has its shortcomings like there's two cameras right now with low batteries that are gonna somebody's gonna have to go out there and change them soon right yeah, but my other property, I'm really struggling because I've got my two Moultries, which were my better cameras. I know I don't know if it's because they're getting old and the detection range is getting shittier on them or what, but it, we're missing a ton of deer on them. Then I'm getting nighttime videos of black screens. So the and this has been going on for a couple of years, but it's getting worse. Where the it's not turning the flash on at night for the videos and crunching through the leaves, and you got no actual video of them Mm. i got 
what now I've been bragging about these $30 Tascos that I've been buying from Walmart. <clears throat> and I got the four that I had and worked really good. I bought two new ones this year and I put one of them up and it's getting me like, it's down to like 40% of the events that it's recording is actually writing a video file. So it's writing, it's creating a file and it's not actually recording any information to the file. So it's like telling me that there was an event, but there's nothing there. So could it be the memory card? I'm formatting the card and I'm using the same, I'm rotating the same cards through all my cameras and it's thick. I, I don't think the card could be causing the Moultrie problem of not using the flash. And I just, I thought it was the Tasco cameras and I figured it was a memory card issue. And then I just went and looked, I pulled three, three cameras, uh, the other day, what was it? Tuesday, I went and pulled three cameras that I haven't been checking as frequently because I have to go farther to get them. And they're all the older ones. They're, they're just you're too old, but they have different firmware, probably because they're eight. They're eight eight gigabyte cameras instead of twelve or uh, megabyte or megapixel. Yeah, megapixel. So it's a different version of the same camera. Yeah. And they don't have one miss on them. Hmm. They're good. Interesting. So then that's the frustrating part about trail cameras. That and that's the part that I love about the Cuddy back system is that we know it's working, it's there, it's connected. Right. You you get status reports daily, so it's like no surprises. There is nothing more frustrating than when you put all that time and effort into putting all these cameras out and you go out there, if you don't have a cell cell signal to it, you go out there a month later or even a week later anticipating that you're going to have some intel that you can use to hunt and the damn thing's not working or it's stolen, it's gone. I mean, it, there's nothing more frustrating and it's, and it, it goes back to that point. It's like, we've become so reliant on it. Like I don't remember my life. I don't remember my life where I woke up in the morning and what it was like to not pick my phone up and look at what came in the night before. I don't right. remember what my life was like before that. It's like I it's probably been six years because I've been running cell cams probably that long, and it's probably been six years every day, 365 days a year. When I wake up, I look at my phone to see what pictures came through from the night before. It's yeah. So what is that like? It's an addiction, and but it's awesome. The the information, the data, it keeps you engaged with this sport, literally all year every day yeah awesome well it's it's you're trying to hunt smarter right so you're trying to use the technology to your advantage but then when it fails you it just makes it more frustrating you know then you know i've heard you talk this year about being like on your public spot where they were messing with your cameras it's like you feel better just going out there and hunting and i get that but the the caliber of deer that i'm trying to hunt on private land in wyoming county is not the type of deer that you can just go and, and just assume that they're going to be there. You have to have intel that's telling you that you're there. I don't need the cameras to tell me how and when to kill them. I would love that if I could get that, but I need to, I need the cameras to tell me that those deer exist and that I'm not wasting my time hunting. Because right now, this whole year, I've been hunting ghosts. Yeah. I've not had one time where a camera has told me that I could kill a true target buck. Like I said, it's told me that I could kill some deer that I would be happy killing, but I got three bucks that I strongly desire to kill, and I don't have one goddamn video of them I since the season but, started, you know? But is there, is, there, is there any part of you that just, like, feels like it, it is too much of a crutch? Like, you, without that, you can't kill them? I mean, you you killed big no. bucks before you had cameras, so it's not no, like... I, no, if I can get one video or at the farm, a cutty, a cutty bag picture. If I can get once every two weeks, if I can get a confirmation that the deer is alive, that's, that's all I need. Yeah. It's, it's truly all I want is to know that the deer is alive, that I can hunt because there's nothing worse than going back after the season and looking back and finding out that some dude shot the deer on October 14th. You spent the whole season. Until December, I've been spending all my time trying to hunt this deer it turns out he was dead the whole time. I mean, that's the kick in the nuts right there. Right. That's all I want. 
Agreed. you know, yeah, Agreed. just want to know he's alive. <laughs> Agreed. I mean, that's two years, two years ago. I killed my, uh, my 10 pointer that way. I, I got one video of him. It was three days or three or four days after the gun season opened. I had a video of him at 7 a.m. coming in off the field. That was it. It was go time. Because I knew that if he made it through the first day or two of gun season and he was still using that property, and let alone in daylight, I knew I had a shot at him. I don't have to check my cameras again after that. I'll take a picture of him when he's dead. I just need to know that the deer exists. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. And the cameras have just been battling me every day this year. I also had... I went through all my cameras last year in August and put brand new lithium batteries in all of them. And I had a great season. I, every one of them lasted right up until this season. We're still alive, still taking pictures in August this year. So brilliant me says, that was a good plan. I'm going to do it again. Took all the lithium batteries out, all my cameras, threw them out, put all new ones in. And one of the cameras had two dead batteries, two dead lithium batteries in. I don't know. Did I somehow put, old ones back in or were they bad batteries i'm guessing they're bad another batteries. one another one of the cameras guess what i did i put one of the batteries in backwards <laughs> but it had enough power to turn on initially so that when i turned the camera on to make sure that it was working and go through the settings everything was fine I come back three weeks later and guess what it never took one fucking picture because it had dead battery that's or it so had a backwards battery that's in it. so frustrating it's it's very frustrating yeah. but it's i I don't know. It just it grinds my gears. That's I, all. I get it. I get it. I feel like your your gears are chirping. Uh, yeah. Okay, last thing I want to talk about, um, and then we'll cut this thing loose. Is uh, um, what do you got for new for new equipment for the year? Anything? Hold on. Let's see. Um, Doug, do you know Doug? Is it Betts? Do you know? Yeah, Beats. Beats. Okay. Yeah. 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 He's been commenting a lot here, so. Um, thank you, Doug, for listening and participating. So he, he agrees with you. He just, he likes having, Ooh, look at that. We'll get to that in just a second. Uh, he's, he agrees with you. He just wants, he doesn't need the cameras for, for to help him kill him. He just wants to know they're alive. And I, I agree with that. That's, and, uh, he asked the question, do you guys believe some bucks truly stay nocturnal though? Like cameras everywhere, bedding, transition, feed, etc. Not a single daylight pick. I think some are just complete nocturnal bucks. What are you, what are your thoughts on that? I I haven't experienced that personally, but I think you know every deer is an individual and it depends on the property as well. I know where Doug hunts, he's got a farm like we do in Attica and I I don't know anything about the property really, but I would suspect two things. One, he could be totally right that the deer is just nocturnal or the deer might just bed and spend most of its daylight hours on somebody else's property and just doesn't get over to where he's hunting them until well after dark. You know, I just, every situation is different, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't, really, yeah. I don't really think that, that there's a, uh, I, I, I just, no, I don't really buy into too deeply the fact that some deer are just truly nocturnal. But it could be age class, too. I mean, Doug killed a, I don't know, a six-year-old deer last year. He killed a giant deer last year. So he might just be hunting a different age class than I am, right. too. So I, I don't, I don't, I mean, I don't think any of them are truly nocturnal. But I think that they, some of them live in places where they get old because they, because they live in places where they have extreme security cover. And yeah. they know if you're coming, like, I think a lot of these deer, and I know from the farm we hunt in Avon, I know some of the spots, we know the spots where some of these bucks live, but to get to them is, it's virtually impossible. And, you know, we get after some of them pushing, you know, bumping them out of some of those, those brush lots and those thickets, but they, they know their escape routes. They know how to get out of there and they have survived by, um, you know, they have sur survived by, uh, by knowing that but but you look at so many of these videos these guys are putting out um you know the dan in faults and the hunting public and and in people that are hunting buck bedding and seeing the sign that they're getting onto in the thick stuff and finding ways to get in and hunt the deer very very close to their bedding 
And I, I don't, I believe that not a lot of those deer actually get up other than a couple of those weeks out of the year when it's breeding time and they're up searching and doing stuff on their feet. I don't think they leave their security cover a whole lot until there is security of the darkness. I don't think they do that. Especially if there's food inside of their security cover, because they do scientifically, they have to eat twice during daylight, right? Five times a day they eat twice. It's going to be during the middle of the day. So they have to get up and move around and eat. But if they're just laying in an area of, you know, if there's apple trees or a little, or whatever kind of browse or whatever that where they spend their days. I mean, that's what I suspect is going on with the, the buck at the farm that we haven't seen since August. I think he, for whatever reason, he joined up with a bachelor group in August and was spending some time out in the open. But I feel like that's probably a four or five year old deer that's living a hundred yards off of the, I, the I bet. Path. I think, I feel like I know, I feel like I have a gut feeling as to where he's living just because of knowing some of these, just at least close to our farm where there's some thick patches that no one ever yeah. goes into and it's impossible to get there's, into them. There's tons of places there where they could live, but this is a deer who's adapted to know that he needs to stay in those yeah. spots until it's safe to leave him, you know? And I think he just, it seemed like he got caught up with a bachelor group a little bit in the summer and, you know, became more visible and, and then disappeared from that routine. So. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's going to be a tough one. He may, he may be a deer that's never going to be killable, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he had, he heard me when I saw him that day on the back porch in August at, at my mother and father-in-law's, I'm standing out there looking at him and 500 my yards away. <laughs> 500 yards away. And my father-in-law comes out on the deck, just slides the door. This door doesn't make any noise, slides the door and comes out and starts talking to me in this tone. And that buck turned all the other deer were just feeding that buck stopped and turned and looked and stared straight at us and then blew off the field from 500 yards away. It's like, what the freak? Like it, it's so that's a different, it's a different class of animal right there. Yeah. That deer. And it's not just, and it's not just their age or anything like that. It's every animal's an individual. And I think yeah. it's a lot of, for the most part, I think that's how they get that old is, is just being like that. But, you know, some older deer are not alert at all. You know, they're just, some of them just become the big cock on the block when they get four or five years old and just start strutting around like a rooster, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they're, everyone's an individual. For sure. I think that's back to Doug's point is that I think that's just probably a lot of them as they get older, they just realize that they can't go anywhere. They can't leave their security during the daylight. Yeah. And they probably, you know, they might leave during the rut, but the thing is, too, the most dominant mature bucks get the does immediately. The does actually search out those dominant mature bucks. So, I mean, they, if they're in a, especially if they're in an area where there are a lot of does, they may be able to wander around for one night, grab a doe, push her back into their cover, and do that until it's time to go get the next one. Yeah. And you might still never see them other than on trail camera in. You know, that might be what you call truly a nocturnal buck, you know. But they're all alive and moving during the daylight, right? They're there somewhere. It's just, are you ever going to see them? You know, you have yeah. to, might have to face the reality sometimes that the buck's just not killable. Yeah. You know, I've, and, and there's, a lot of, there, there's a lot of known big buck killers out there that have said that they've just, there's been bucks where they just, no matter what they did, they couldn't kill them, yeah. you know. But that's where it comes back to, depending on what your mentality is and your style of hunting, if you are a guy that likes to hunt with a group of guys and you tactically like to go after some of these situations, you can target those deer knowing where you generally know they live. There's just a lot of things you can't get at. You can't get there. There's a spot, yeah. there's a spot up at camp that I stumbled across. I've been, I've been hunting this spot. Dad set me up a tree seat. There's a, it's on a real steep side hill, all hemlock, and you can sit there at, at the bottom of this side hill looking up 150, 200 yards to the, side, to the top of the hill. And it's, like, amazing. And I hunted that a ton when I was younger, from probably 16 to, to my early 20s, mid-20s, so probably five, six, eight years. I would see deer, but I wouldn't see a lot of deer. And it didn't make a lot of sense because there was so much sign up on that side hill, but I would never see deer. But what it was is I'd access it from the bottom all the time, and the deer bed on that side hill, and they would be bedded there by the time I come in. Even if I came in 20 minutes before light, they were back there already. And 
they would yeah. watch me come in and, and bust out before I ever even knew that they were there. So a couple, it was like three years ago. We had a, it was the night before Thanksgiving, and we had a really stiff wind out of the north. And I don't know why, we had we had been talking a lot on this podcast, and I'd been learning a lot about thermals. And so I was thinking to myself, I'm like, we got a wicked front coming through with a north wind that's going to be blowing that wind straight up the hill. I'm like, I'm going to go over there right in that last 45 minutes to an hour of daylight. I'm going to sneak over the side of the hill here. And, and this was after we went and did that scouting adventure with Steve Shirk and saw where he's pinpointing some of these deer. And, like, it was kind of coming together for me that this might be an area. And I popped my head over that hill. Wind is howling. So that it was covering my noise. I popped my head over the hill, and I looked down, and there's deer everywhere. There was, there was deer moving around. I, I didn't have a shot, um, but I, had, I saw a big buck um, in there. Never, never could get on him to take a shot. I backed out. The weather was going to stay the same throughout the night. I came back in the morning, dropped over, and those deer were all still in there in the same spot. Not futz, they, they were just milling around in there on this side hill. But almost always we have approached it from the bottom to come up, and they, are, they got you. Is the second you try to step up on that side hill, they know you're there. So – I think that's where a lot of these scenarios are, these big bucks and, and even does for that matter. When it gets hard to find them, they're just in the spots where they've got the advantage topographically or, you know, in ag land, they've got a brush lot that they can sit on the edge of and smell what's coming behind them and they can watch what's approaching what they can't smell. I mean, I think that's a lot of what we have in ag land that we have here in, in, in cover. And, that, and once you start to put those pieces together, it helps you understand – maybe why you're not having the success, but also how you can better access your property, access is everything. Ben Williams hammers on that. And when you start to pay attention to those things, like that will Im- immediately change the success rate you're going to have when you go out. If, you, if you're not bumping deer going in, you're going to be in a good situation because they don't know you're there. Yeah, I think, the, I think probably the last two or three years, the thing that I've learned more about is probably than – anything else maybe ever is is thermals and the way that the thermals actually act in terrain in uh, elevation and then how they act in accordance with the wind and you know that that's the hardest thing is how the wind and the terrain in the thermals interact with each other but i've gotten a really crash course on thermals and how they rise and fall the last couple of years and i'm now trying to use that to my advantage and into my plan with hunting you know i'm looking at the the still the wind direction it's the most important thing for me but i'm really looking at or thinking about the thermals in accordance with that and trying to figure out how to hunt that and it can be maddening but it can also be really helpful if you get a little bit of an understanding of that because i've 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 come to some hard lessons where i where i failed miserably and that but then figured out why like we were talking about before and and realized what i did wrong and then tried to make an adjustment to that and now i'm i feel like i'm turning the tables a little bit to try to use that to my advantage yeah and i know that you know i've i've been a flatlander most of my life and you've been a hill country guy most of your life so you you have to you, you learn hard lessons when you come into these other situations. You know, you've talked about it before. Like when you started hunting at the farm, you had no idea about wind direction because mm-hmm. you've just been used to hunting so, yep. hills and hills your whole life, you know, yeah. like, I, so I'm the other way around. But we so. never paid attention to wind because there was no true wind. So it was never right. even part of a, dis- like never, yeah. ever, ever once did dad, now, did dad right. or uncle Mike or anybody say, well, we're going to go here today because of the wind never yeah. was never said. And it, I don't think it was ever something that was on their minds. I no. just never was no, talking because, about because that's how they always hunt it. But you, but you've, I've heard you talk about this before too. Like once you realize that then over time you realize that if the wind bl- did blow North or South or a certain direction where you could count on the wind, right. But that's even better because now you know what days where the wind direction will actually affect the way you can hunt as opposed to just hunting the thermals yeah. or just knowing that it's going to be swirly and just don't even go in, you know, that's that's a lot of it too. Like there's days where you know that the wind direction is going to cause a swirling effect all over the, this side of the hill, where you got to say, "Hey, I need to hunt the other side of the hill, or I just need to stay home or go somewhere else." Right? I mean, it's all part of it. Yep. 
but sometimes knowing that the because always the actual direction of the wind is going to affect how those thermals work mm-hmm. in in the hill country. Absolutely. All right, let's. I want to. I want to hear about your gun real quick. Let's talk guns. All right. Uh, you, we got new new toys. That's the the yeah. highlights. So what do you got? Yeah. So I went to. Uh, what did they have? Four seminars this year, this summer in the NDA. Yeah. Yeah, the upper so, upper Genesee River Branch. You know more about that, but I went with you to one, and they uh, they had a rifle on display that they were taking. Every time you showed up, they would take your name, put it in a hat for a drawing at the end of the year. And I managed to go to one out of the four and got a call a month ago or so and was told that I want a rifle. So this is a uh, Weatherby Vanguard. I think the original one might have been a high country, but I wanted a different uh, caliber. So I just went and picked this up today from... uh, it was at Gaylord's Guns and Ammo in uh, Andover. Yeah, right there. Was it Andover near Wellsville? Yeah. Yeah. So they originally had a, uh, this is first light camo, which I own none of. So, <laughs> so the deer are totally going to see you coming. Yeah, I, the deer are going to see me coming. Plus, I got this wild loophole scope that I used to have on my shotgun. with. Uh, they, I think they called this camo, but it's like purple paint. Yeah. So, I don't know, it's a little bit of a mismatch gun, but yeah. I've been shouldering it and uh, cycling the bolt tonight and been pretty happy with it. It's, pretty, it's a beautiful gun. Pretty damn comfortable with it already. So, yeah, really nice. Couldn't try to shoot it this week and see if it's something I can get ready for opening day or that's if a, not. It's a 270, right? Yeah, so originally the, the gun that they, they had actually bought the gun and had it on display, and it was uh, six point. I didn't even, never heard of this. It was a 6.5 300 Weatherby Magnum. So <laughs> Yeah, it was a really very odd caliber. When Sean to told me that, I asked him what it was over the phone, and he told me that, and, I'm like, and I was like, oh, okay. I was like, <laughs> Well, yeah, it's a free gun I, you're excited about. Yeah. I was excited, and I heard him say 6.5, but then I heard him say Magnum. I'm like, what the <laughs> heck is he talking about? So I even... Even my dad didn't know about it, and he knows the rifles. But he looked it up right away, and he came back, and he's like, oh, it's a like a super long-range gun. So it's a newer caliber that Weatherby developed. Yeah. And it's meant for long-range shooting. It has crazy ballistics at the long range. So at first I was like, oh, that sounds cool. And then I looked up the price of ammo. It's like $6 a round for factory ammo. And then I thought, okay, so... <laughs> If I want to buy a scope that's capable of shooting 500 yards, I'm I'm in probably 800 or a thousand dollars already. Then I'm gonna start buying ammo that'll, you know, for the gun. Right. Like by the time I'm ready to go on a high country mule deer hunt, I'll be five grand in, in debt at least trying to shoot this free rifle, right? So I thought, you know, maybe I just ask him if I can get a 270 because I already have ammo loaded up, and my 270, I love it. It shoots great, but it's heavy as hell. It has a magazine clip that sometimes just likes to open oh, up, right. and, yeah. you know, and spit the bullets out. So it's like, <laughs> so yeah, they told me, yeah, you can have a 270. So I went and picked it up today. So I'm, yeah, I'm excited about my new toy. It's awesome. I got a new, I got a new toy too. Yeah. I, I got, about it. I got a, a Henry all weather 4570 lever action rifle and uh, I found it used stumbled across it at a gun shop down in Addison and uh cool little gun store it's called Guns R Us and uh it's been there for about a year year and a half um cool little store and I popped in there I needed a pair of a set of scope rings and I started wandering around next thing I know I see this gun sitting there and I'm like oh my god that gun's freaking beautiful so it's a it's got like a a, a maple or a walnut stock um and then the actual frame of the gun is stainless. And uh, and I put, so it had a big freaking scope on it. It had a SIG 3 by 9 by 50 scope on it, which was kind of ridiculous on a, on a gun like that. So, yeah. I, so I took the scope off and actually put it on my 7 mag and, uh, and sighted that in last weekend. And I, I bought a, a rear peep sight um, from Skinner Sights. 
Uh, the Big Woods yeah. Bucks guys talk about them, so I've been wanting to For check sure. this stuff yeah. out. And uh, so I bought I bought one of the Skinner sites, and uh, and I actually so I shot that, and that gun is a freaking ass kicker, man. That 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 round is huge, yeah. And um, so I I shot that, and I was way way high. So it turns out I've actually needed to buy a new uh, a new front sight because my uh, because with that rear aperture being set higher on the receiver, I needed to be able to to have a higher front sight. So I actually talked to them today. I took some measurements and shot the gun again and, and figured out how high I was. And I guess they have an equation that they use to figure out how tall of a front sight you need. So that's uh, I got a front sight coming, and that'll be my my deer pushing mountain ridge running gun pretty excited about that apparently it shoots out to like 200 yards the ballistic show so that's pretty impressive right emma yeah what's your dad doing back there he just left you to co-host here i don't know don't know i, I think i'm really good at it though so it doesn't matter yeah so i i mean we're kind of talent down here unless your your father's got anything for us do you, you have any anything you want to add are you excited about gun season to start i have a gun yeah i know you do yeah you're on pigeon duty yeah you guys pretty effective yeah i think they're eliminated until a new (laughs) crew comes in but i welcome the challenge (laughs) yeah (laughs) well you got i'm i'm about burnout here do you got anything else you want to chew the fat on or you good no, I'm good. Okay. Just, just going to keep grinding. That's uh looks like this going to be a keep grinding. That's my seat. I just lost the internet. You know, not a lot of time out in the field, but it doesn't I don't think this year's it's going to pay. Oh, apparently that's it. All right, well, that's a wrap on this week's episode of the Pertinier Outdoors podcast. Hope you have fun this weekend out there in the woods, and I hope you have some success, and we will uh, we'll see you and talk to you about how the first weekend of gun season goes. Keep painting them. <laughs>